Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Disability Justice, Climate Change, and Ecoableism. We're so excited to welcome you to our panel this evening, which will be focused on disabilities in environmental and activism spaces. I'm Kailani Acosta, and I'm a third year PhD student in Earth and Environmental Sciences. And I've worked with Benjamin Kiesling, who's a postdoc in geochemistry, and Lauren Ritchie, who's a Columbia undergrad, to create Columbia Climate Conversations. We would like to thank the Columbia Arts and Sciences Graduate Council for sponsoring tonight's event. This is the fourth and final event of the semester in the Columbia Climate Change uh, Climate Conversation series, highlighting critical topics at the intersection of earth science, sustainability, and environmentalism. Captioning tonight is provided by the National Captioning Institute. I wanna start by amplifying the work and words of the Native American Council at Columbia University. The Lenape lived here before and during the colonization of the Americas. We recognize these indigenous people of Manhattan, their displacement, dispossession, and continued presence. This acknowledgement stands as a reminder to reflect on our past as we contemplate our way forward. This event was imagined, planned, and made possible by Lauren Ritchie, a 19-year-old climate activist, writer, podcast host, and third-year student in sustainable development and political science at Columbia. She is the creator of the EcoGal, which is a digital platform that educates on climate justice, promotes intersectional climate action, and seeks to make sustainable living more accessible and inclusive by amplifying the voices of marginalized communities. Please join me in welcoming our moderator and host for the rest of the evening, Lauren Ritchie. Hi, Kalani. Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to tonight's event. I'm really, really grateful um, for everyone who came and showed up for this panel. I'm really excited for this conversation. We have three amazing panelists here today to have a conversation about disability justice, which is something that we don't really talk about often enough within climate conversations, especially within the environmental sciences. So I'm really, really excited for the conversation that we're going to have today. And without further ado, I will let the three amazing panelists we have here today introduce themselves, let you know um, a little bit more about the work that they're doing. So Daphne, why don't you get us started? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm so excited to be here with you all. Lauren, thank you so much for inviting me to this amazing event. Um, and I, I cannot wait for our conversation tonight. Uh, I am a 23 year old youth organizer. I'm uh, a proud disabled youth activist, um, born and raised in West Harlem. I got started in uh, climate justice work shortly uh, after I moved away from home to attend undergrad. Um, and while I attended undergrad, I started to realize um, that the environment I was living in at home was being consistently destroyed by the socioeconomic effects of the climate crisis. Um, uh, born and raised um, in West Harlem, I was seeing how urban planning and the racism of urban planning was playing into the climate destroying infrastructures in my community and nobody was really talking about it. Um, and I, I didn't really see any disabled Latino organizers talking about how my communities were at the forefront um, of the climate justice movement. And I really do not think that we can begin to combat the climate crisis if we're not having all voices part of the conversation. Uh, so I'm so excited to be here and to be chatting with you all. Thank you, Daphne. Um, Gabby, why don't you go next? Hi, I'm Gabby Serrato Marks. I am um, based in Boston. I recently finished my PhD in geochemistry and past climate change at MIT in the MIT Woods Hole Joint Program. And so I am a client, climate scientist by training. Um, and I uh, primarily work now in science communication, in building better, more inclusive science communities. And um, I also identify as disabled. And that has been quite the journey trying to um, integrate climate science and my identity and, and needs as, as a disabled person. So thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited for this conversation. Annie, your turn. Go ahead. Hi. Um, all right. My name is Annie Sagara online. 
often known as Annie Eleni. That is the name I use for my YouTube channel and all my social media platforms. I am an activist and I advocate for uh, my disabled community, my LGBT community, and um, my multiple marginalizations that I experience. Um, and I guess something I do a lot is engage in dialogue online with my communities, um, which has allowed me to see parts of the conversation in climate change that are very often neglected in the big picture. Um, something that has unfortunately taken a big focus in my work in the past few years is conversations about uh, straw bans and the efforts to combat um, a, p a pollution issue and, and a plastic issue and having to consistently explain uh, how something like that, not just straw ban specifically, but these very blanket bans and these blanket statements about basically villainizing um, certain items as um, harmful to the environment and not necessarily including disability in that dialogue is extremely dangerous, extremely harmful to, to the communities. Um, so while I'm incredibly passionate about climate change and about protecting the planet, I also believe that we should really leave room for that nuance, for how it is that we can include disabilities in our efforts to, to uh, combat climate change and how we can make it more accessible and less ableist. So I'm incredibly excited and encouraged that conversations like this are happening. Thank you so much, all of you, for your great introductions. I'm fangirling right now being able to talk to all of you, but thank you so much for the amazing work that you're doing, um, for just being such passionate advocates for disability justice and for climate justice as well. It's all very, very inspiring, so thank you. Um, now that that's out of the way, my little fangirling moment. Um, but getting into like the grounding for this conversation or a little bit of background, what are some of the greatest challenges faced by people with disabilities? And kind of as a twofold question, why is disability justice then so important? You could go in any order that you'd like, just jump in. Um, I'm gonna jump in if that's okay. Um, so, Something I always say is that all justice is disability justice, right? There is not one intersection that the disability community doesn't fall into. Uh, Health care, racial justice, LGBTQ plus justice, reproductive rights. Um, I mean, there, uh, the list goes on, you know, in some of the other work I do, I'm also very passionate about gun violence prevention. That's also a disability justice issue. Um, because the thing is that people with disabilities, are we're not a monolith. We experience life in many different ways. Um, and all of our bodies are, are different. And the way that our, our, our lived experiences are, we, we exist on a spectrum. And that spectrum is very vast um, and very beautiful. Um, and I think it's a misconception to think that disability justice can live in a silo. Um, because the truth is, if you are not including voices of disability of the disabled in your justice work, you're missing, you're missing the point. You're missing a whole community that need, has their has a need and their voices need to be amplified in those movements. Um, I think some of the biggest challenges we face is often not being seen as leaders and um, having the ability to lead change and justice making conversations. When the truth is uh, people with disabilities have been fighting for justice for decades, it's ingrained within our community and our culture because we've seen so often how we live in sort of an invisible space and we have to always wave the flag and say, I'm here, we're here. Um, and I think that power and that determination can ignite any issue that we set our minds to. Uh, and I think that if you're not including us in the conversation, you're missing 
such amazing fire and passion that can be included into your movement. Um, I think similar to what Annie was saying, the, you know, our community is amazing that we've learned um, that, you know, the ones who protect us are us. We have a community of people who we, you know, swap medication, we, we swap, um, you know, chronic pain tips, we swap all these different, different things just to keep us going. Um, and what the has taught us is that no one is left behind. Nothing about us without us. We're always there and we have each other's back no matter what. Um, and I think that, you know, as Annie was saying, the thing that we can bring to this conversation is the nuance and the fact that while the climate crisis is incredibly important, there are communities that are being affected and oppressed by this system. And we have to uplift their voices first before we let the change making make their voices invisible. Daphne, oh my God, you, you made me so emotional. <laughs> uh, I literally have uh, tears in my eyes right now. Um, just in, in how I resonate with um, what you said about uh, community and how like it, it's it's um, the disability community and being a part of it, um, as much as maybe we don't want to admit it, um, we are very vulnerable, right? And, and one of the most uh, people love to use that word very, very freely, that the disabled community is a very vulnerable community. And often it comes with um, this um, emotion of pity, right? The, the, the disabled community is so vulnerable, but it's, it's, it is the system that keeps us that way. Um, and we're constantly having to kind of, I just have this image in my mind of like protecting our own and, and engaging in that kind of community and that kind of like, here, here's what I've done, you try that, and not coming from a voice that is condescending, of course, not coming from a voice from outside the community, like, have you tried yoga yet? Have you tried the essential oils, etc. It's a, a genuine, like, you and I are in similar positions. Uh, here's something that I've tried. Let's see, let's see if this works for you too. Um, it's just it's such a different, it's a different language, really. Um, and, and so I guess the root question was like, what, what is disability justice and why is it so important? At, at its most basic, disabled people are people, <laughs> and but they're treated like they're not it, within this society and with this system that we live in. Um, there are so many, so many elements of the current system and society that we live in that constantly dehumanizes the entire community, right down to the language, right down to like a demanding that we separate ourselves from the identity, demanding that we use person first language and don't call yourself a disabled person, call yourself a person with a disability. When that's really one of the only identities that exist to my knowledge, to, to my memory <laughs> that they demand that of. The, like, because I can say I'm a gay person, I'm a Latina person, and there's an assumed humanity and personhood that comes with that. But, but if I say I'm a disabled person, oh no, feathers are ruffled, pearls are clutched, how dare you? <laughs> you, you must separate yourself from that identity. So that implies to me that they hear disabled and humanity and personhood is taken away from that. Um, so that's how that's most basic. That's why kind of language, language and communication is very important to me also as an autistic person, but um, like that's a, that's at its most basic. And unfortunately we, we have to keep having that conversation that shows how neglected the disabled community is in almost every conversation of activism, um, whether it's feminism, uh, and um, that's where the future is accessible came from, which is that during the first women's march in the United States, disability community was very much neglected in the planning of that. Um, so the future is accessible came came about to kind of hold up a flag and be like, y'all need to make this activism accessible and intersectional. Um, and then in, 
in those conversations, in feminism, in the conversations about the environment and climate change, we constantly kind of have to push our way into the space and be like, we're here, disabled community exists, and we identify this way. And we often have to unfortunately start at that 101 place where we have to kind of educate people about how we see ourselves and how we how our community actually is um, versus the idea that they've painted about disability, about that we are some kind of like pitiful um, possibility for themselves and their loved ones um, something that unfortunately has this like taintedness of like, they would rather be dead than disabled, which is a very common, um, thing that I've heard that is said throughout media. So disability justice is important, <laughs> uh, because it is, <laughs> I don't know how much, how much more I can go into that off the top of my head, but it, it's important because it's so neglected and it, and it really is so unfortunate that we every time we enter any kind of activism space we have to kind of start from the beginning with with uh how to integrate our community into the rest i think the only other thing i would add to those excellent uh starting points there is that um disability can really touch everyone and it can be either something that you experience in your life or that you experience as a partner, as a kid, as any kind of relationship that you have, disability can be part of that. And so I think it's important to recognize that there's like the 20% ish or more of people who experience disability. I think that's a US statistic, but at least 20%. But then there's all the people who are older and have a hip replaced. And at that point, maybe they're experiencing something that's similar to what disabled people experience. And so um, sort of like what everyone was just saying that the way that we're kind of cast to the side is like that's a different community is really just not accurate because anyone could be disabled at any point in their life. Thank you so much to three of you for yeah just sharing that insight and also just your personal experiences in that way. I think everything that you guys have touched on has been so, so not just inspiring, but also just illuminating in the types of things like, Annie, what you were talking about with, you know, the way that we kind of, I guess, I guess silo the disabled community with, you know, trying to tell them how they should identify or how they should speak. And I think, like you were saying, language and communication is so important. And I want to make sure that we, you know, get to that conversation when we talk about ableism and how casual it can be in the way that we don't really think about it. Um, but I think kind of going off with some of the other things that you guys have mentioned about, you know, being in these activism spaces and what it's like to want to be an activist, to want to be an advocate and kind of to be cast aside what do you all feel are some of the biggest misconceptions about disabled individuals within activism spaces? I know a lot of the time when we think about activism, we kind of think of this kind of one size fits all approach when it comes to, you know, you have to be at the marches and the protests, or you have to, um, a lot of other things. There's a lot of other things that go into that, but you know, that tends to exclude a lot of different people and makes people feel like they can't participate or that what they're doing isn't enough. So have you ever felt left out of that one size fits all type of approach when it comes to social justice or environmentalism? And just, you know, what does activism or being an activist look like to you or mean to you? Well, it's kind of a three part question, but I would love to hear anything that you all have. All right, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, uh, yeah, that is a three part question. I'm trying, trying to like organize my thoughts a little bit, but um, biggest misconceptions about disability and activism and like being an activist. Um, I don't know. I used to, when I was in high school and I was more able bodied, I did used to go to the marches. Uh, and over time, um, as uh, my uh, health declined with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and I, I became a wheelchair user and I have also um, heat intolerance because of uh, POTS. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things that really keep me from protesting outdoors, protesting uh, in the streets, 
Um, also, like if I ever got maced, I would have a real problem <laughs> because my because uh, I have allergies that would close my throat in the presence of that kind of pepper. Um, so yeah, it would, it would be a yikes. It would be a yikes. But um, it in my current interpretation of what being an activist is, is doing whatever you can to 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 spark change and create change and for me that has taken on things such as just being visible online and creating spaces for dialogue uh because little like i say little but i don't know i i just i you, i use the word little little just now just projecting off of like what able-bodied activists might think about it to be honest but it's not so little to have these organize conversations and dialogue with community and to make yourself visible on the internet. It's not actually such a small thing, uh, even if other people would want to be, belittle that. Um, I think it takes a lot of vulnerability. I think it takes a lot of effort and time and patience, um, which I don't always have the most of sometimes I'm like, like uh, we're having conversations today about straw bands and I'm a little like, it's been years. We're still talking about it. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a state. I'm not the most patient person, but I do try and I, and I, and I want to try and have these conversations and I'll have them as many times as I need to. Um, because I have seen the potential it has. I has, I have seen what kind of changes that, talking and talking and talking can make with people. Um, something else that uh, is a part of my activism that I have to repeat almost on a daily basis is that ambulatory wheelchair users exist, um, which is uh, wheelchair users with the ability to walk, stand, dance, run, but still do need to use their wheelchairs when they're using them. Um, and constantly coming across people who don't believe that don't believe that there is such thing as wheelchair users who can walk and if they ever see you so much as cross your legs while you're using a wheelchair they uh, feel entitled to harass you maybe assault you maybe call um government services on you and tell them that you've been lying about your disability um so <laughs> there's a lot of risk there's a lot of danger right now just for wheelchair users who are ambulatory um, however, from repeatedly, repeatedly, almost on a daily basis, having those conversations, I'm often met with the response, oh, I never considered that that was a possibility. And as much as that's like a weird, emotionally double-edged sword for me, like it, it sucks to hear. It's also good to hear. Um, for me, sometimes emotionally, when I hear, I never considered that, um, it it hurts i'm like why have you never considered my community before uh so it's a little bit of an ouch it's kind of like i guess if a date it's like oh i never thought of you that way like it's, it's 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 like it's a little like ouch why what's wrong with me <laughs> why haven't you considered me um but the second part is the really is the win and ticket which is that now the person has now they have considered it and now because i'm talking about it so much hopefully i prevented that person from ever harassing someone else who's in that position hopefully i prevented um some kind of nasty situation with this person and that person can go on to tell other people um you know and 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 eventually It'll be common knowledge and I, and I won't have to be so scared every time I walk my dog and have to like stand up to pick up a poo or something. <laughs> like eventually the day will come where I, where I will feel safe to do that with, without like uh, anxiety about violence or harassment. Um, so I think that especially disabled activists need to give themselves more credit. Um, it's so easy, just like how I, I started speaking right now. So doing these little things, like they're not so little. They really aren't. They really impact um, a lot of things socially. They impact public opinion. They they impact eventually the politics of things um, in, in essence of like the things that I do, which is uh, like YouTube videos and content creation. Um, so 
disabled activism is real activism. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be looked down upon um, by the person doing it or by anybody else. Gabby, you go. Okay. Something I see a lot in the climate activism community is that people do that same thing that Annie's talking about. Like, I've never considered that. And so they say, they'll say like, you know, I'm going to go on this podcast and do outreach about climate science, which I think is great. But the podcast doesn't have a transcript with it and it's all in English. So like, you're really just reaching out to people who can understand English speech, which is only a small part of the world's population. And so I see, I, once they point it out, people will usually be like, oh, you're right. Like, I, I hadn't thought about how that's only a small group of people or a smaller group than I could be reaching if this were translated or there were a transcript or something along those lines. But it's like, how could you not have thought about it? Like, how could you have had the privilege your whole life to have never thought about that, I guess? Um, so that really resonates with me too, because I hear that from climate scientists. I hear that from science communicators who don't caption any of their videos. Um, people who say like, oh, I didn't realize that anyone blind might be looking at my Instagram feed. Like, yes, <laughs> consider it and, and do something about it. So um, I think when people, especially scientists are talking about outreach, oftentimes the disabled community is one that's sort of forgotten about or not considered. Yeah, oh man, Gabby, that resonates with me so much. Uh, I've been a public health scholar for the past 10 years of my life. Um, even though I'm 23 and time is weird and like, I don't know, I'm old and young. It's just, I don't know. Um, but when I tell people that I'm a scientist, they're like, question mark, what? You do science? And I'm like, yeah, actually. Um, I'm getting my MD MPH right now at Johns Hopkins. Like I've literally, <laughs> I've been working towards this goal for so many years. Um, but when I try to tell people that the climate crisis is a public health issue and the, they're like, what, what, what are you talking about? You're literally crazy. And it's just like your disability invalidates any other knowledge that you may possess in your head because that is the only thing that people are gonna see you as. And you're constantly having to weed through that mirage and be like, yes, I have other identities. I do other things. My disability matters and it's a huge part of my identity, but it doesn't like t completely encompass who I am as a person. Um, I And just in general, like, the fields of STEM are incredibly ableist. Um, it's just insane when I think about um, when I was, you know, interviewing for medical school, admissions committees told me that my disability would be a liability to my patients. Um, and I was like, you don't think I thought about that before I invested like thousands of dollars to go to medical school? No? Okay. Um, and but I think specifically within the activism space, the thing that I always try to tell my disabled siblings is this space is going to try to commodify your voice and commodify your story because you fit that pretty, you know, marginalized narrative that makes great photo ops, that brings in the donations, that brings in the grants. Um, and I think it's really important to go into those spaces knowing your story in and out in a way that you know that your voice is entirely and completely valid and that no, you know, no organization or any system is going to make you waver in your strength and your story. Um, I cannot tell you how many times I've been contacted about, you know, being on this and being on that and doing this, this pan or whatever it may be. And coming to see that I'm only there for like that diversity quota or, or, or that specific photo op. And it's like our voices matter more than just that moment or when, or your allyship should matter when no one is watching. Your allyship should be there when everything is gone, all the cameras are gone, all the social media is gone. That's what really matters. Um, 
And, you know, I always say the power of storytelling is so important. If you can see someone out there doing what you want to do, speaking up and embracing their stories wholeheartedly the way that you wish you could, it helps you become that version of yourself that you want to be. Um, so I'd say for anyone listening, embrace your stories, embrace the power of your stories, because no matter how many other similar identities may intersect, no one is you and no one can tell your story and no one can hold the space that you hold. Uh, so own it and be proud of it. That was beautiful. Thank you so, so much for sharing. Yes, I completely wholeheartedly agree with everything that you all have talked about, especially I think because we're transitioning this conversation a little bit into like environmentalism, especially. Um, and I know you've already talked about those straw bands. We're about to get there, we're about to talk about those right now. Um, but I think kind of leaping off what we were just talking about with, you know, how it is, um, you know, there is types of like ways that, you know, disabled individuals have been kind of cast aside within activism spaces especially when it comes to vulnerability to the climate crisis, I think that is a very big conversation in and of itself. In one, I guess the ways that, you know, disabled individuals are more vulnerable to the impacts of the climate crisis, and we can get into a conversation of what those impacts are, um, but also just how disabled individuals are not prioritized when it comes to policy, when it comes to adaptation, when it comes to planning, and just, you know, the climate conversation in general, um, the ways that disabled individuals have been cast aside and not been included in this conversation. So I would love to hear from the three of you about just your experience with how disabled individuals have been treated within the context of the climate crisis. Uh, your your first, first part of your question is how climate change impacts disabled people, right? Um, how doesn't it? Uh, so I, I guess like the first most obvious response in my mind is the natural disasters and the issues with evacuation and the issues with uh, relocation um, for areas that may become flooded. I live in Florida, so yikes, we've thought about that. <laughs> we've thought about how um, Miami might disappear at some point. Um, and we've managed now to figure out some money to move a little bit more north, but still in Florida, it's a scary situation. Um, but natural disasters like hurricanes and blizzards and earthquakes and forest fires, like it's happening already, even if like mix the natural disasters, like it's happening already that many buildings still do not have any kind of adequate plan regarding wheelchair users and non-working elevators and how they are to evacuate, right? And that said, it's most basic and simple. You don't even need a natural disaster and you don't know how you're getting your disabled uh, citizens to safety. Um, so, and then, so that's natural disasters on their own, but then climate change in general, like does in, fa in fact impact health. Um, another situation that I personally deal with is, um, so I have postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome and um, a, a level of heat intolerance that causes me to faint. Um, so in the summers in Florida with a house that's not like properly insulated, I'm fainting the entire summer. I lose my entire summer uh, because I'm knocked out. I'm, I'm asleep because my my body cannot handle to get up. It's a, it's a, a blood pressure issue the, because of the heat, my blood vessels aren't working properly and I can't get up. So that is so gosh, it is such a big question. That's why my, the first thing I said is how doesn't it, because it, if climate change affects our health, uh, of disabled people and of people who are not yet disabled, but may become disabled by climate change. Um, as well as how do you get your disabled members to safety in regards to natural disaster evacuations? Um, uh, it, it, it goes on. I can, I can, I can definitely leave space for, for the rest of us to continue speaking on it, but yeah, it's a lot. Here we go. I want to hear your voice. <laughs> you go first. Okay. You go first. Um, uh, 
oh man this is this, I'm trying to like not think about the straw thing like that's just like swimming in the back of my head because like I was at a restaurant today and I asked for a straw and they were like no and I was like I can't have this argument right now um so yeah that, that's a that's a thing but I think something that isn't talked about because it, it's a, a little bit more nuanced but the fact that when we talk about the climate crisis and how to solve it there is a huge focus on individualistic impacts like recycling like doing stuff like that and while that is important the biggest goal we need to be reaching for is divestment right so when people try to put the onus on the disabled community to somehow do a part of the work to end the climate crisis. It's like, we're facing multiple systems of oppression that have led us to the climate crisis and to have ableism in the first place. So how are you asking an already oppressed community to sacrifice the bare minimum and to sacrifice the products and the devices that they need to literally survive? Like my, like 75% of my wheelchair is made of plastic. Are you telling me to throw away my wheelchair? Like, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, so I think it's about stop scapegoating the disabled people because you feel like they're easy targets and you feel like we're not doing enough to end the climate crisis when you really should be focusing on divestment and understanding that divestment is the only way we're going to solve the climate crisis. Um, I also think that the climate crisis can also make people disabled um, and aggravate disabilities. When we talk about, you know, the forest fires at the beginning of last year, there's still friends of mine who lost all of their mobility devices and all of their equipment that they need to survive and more than 365 days later they still don't have those things and they're surviving on the bare minimum or, or barely surviving at all to be honest um and it's like i'm sorry i can't be concerned about the earth burning but like i can't breathe and i can't leave my house like it's those things where it's like you have to meet the community where it's at and address um sort of the comorbidity comorbidities and the quality of life issues that they're facing before you can have conversations about how do we as a community stop the climate crisis because to be honest people with disabilities are exploited by the same industries and the same communities that have exacerbated the climate crisis in the first place um so we're not trying to be enemies of the climate crisis we feel the same systems of oppression we feel the same impacts and we have to work together instead of being alienated because of straws and ridiculous notions um when when we can put away those arbitrary you know conversations we can really come together to make a difference but until we shift our perspective on what's really important we're not gonna we're not gonna really get anywhere I've seen a shocking amount of hostility coming from scientists towards disabled activists and people who are saying, you know, there's all this pollution in the ocean. I know, like I've, re I've read the same textbooks as you, I've read the same articles as you, I, I know, but at the same time, like we are saying that this is something that we need and no one wants to be wasteful right like there's no one who wakes up in the morning is like i will waste so much plastic today i don't think like i doubt that there's anyone who's like purposefully throwing things away like no one wants to do that but people literally just can't conceive of the fact that like you might need to like maintain a sterile port and that involves throwing a lot of things away and like it would be cheaper to be able to reuse it or to be able to sanitize it or something like there's plenty of motivations and so I think reducing that hostility, like I've literally had a climate scientist say to me, like, I don't get this whole thing with the straw ban, like bring your own effing straw. It's like, what? <laughs> Do you bring your own fork to the restaurant? Like, it's just, it's so much anger because people are so passionate about it. And instead we could work together and say, these forest fires are awful. They are impacting the forest, the land, the soil, 
and they are also impacting the people who live there, including people who have lost mobility devices, right? Like it doesn't have to be one or the other. It can be something that we work together. And by including disabled activists and disabled scientists, I think that we can make a big difference. There. I think everything that you all have talked about just now is a great segue into, you know, a conversation that we've just been having about how exclusionary you know, the climate community, climate action can be when it comes to disabled individuals. And also just thinking about like language and communication when it comes to ableism as well, because I think ableism is, is something that I've, you know, heard talked about a lot more now. I hadn't heard that term used before. And I think, you know, now that people are coming to educate themselves more, to learn more about what ableism is, what casual ableism is, how it shows up in our everyday life. Um, I think there is, you know, a lot of the education process, which is explaining to people why, I guess, kind of going off what Gabby was saying, why th things don't make sense. Like the idea of bringing your own straw to the restaurant when you don't bring your own fork to the restaurant, just little things, well, not little, anything, but things like that, you know, that we don't typically think about. So I think just to, I guess, as a grounding for this conversation, and what is ableism? What is casual ableism? How do they show up in our everyday life? And I guess more examples of how, I guess, climate action can be ableist. And this is actually, I'm going to wait for the next question. I've been giving you a lot of questions all at once. Let's start there and then we'll move on. Um, I, I, I'm going to start if it's okay. Or Annie, if you want to go. Okay. Um, so I the first thing that comes to mind, and this doesn't necessarily have to do with climate, but the the idea of like inspiration and disability, like what is that? I can spend six hours talking about that because it's like, for example, when I got into med school, I was sitting around on a, in a table, on a cafeteria table with my mentors. And I was like, guys, I did it like I got into med school. Like, it's crazy. And everyone literally I kid you not everyone started crying and I'm like why are we crying why did someone die like did I miss something and everybody's like you did it like this despite your disability oh oh my god and I said I need to I I and I said to them I was like I'm gonna roll away now because I'm not emotionally prepared for this conversation and my thing is like if an able-bodied person was going to med school would y'all be crying I don't think so. And it's the fact that like society has like villainized disability so much that it's like it's like a like we're so vehemently opposed to the idea that our bodies might not always be functioning the way that they should be that the minute that someone does something that's very commonplace it's like wow you've you're an Olympian that's it you made it your whole life set you've done it and it's like we're just living our normal lives like we're just living our life the way that we're 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 best able to um and I think instead of using the word you know inspiration I always say there's nothing wrong with motivation and seeing someone doing something and saying you know I've always wanted to do that too, or I, I've never seen, you know, another, another young Latina doing the work that, you know, I'm doing, seeing what I'm doing and feeling motivated by that. I think just that gradual shift from inspiration to motivation is like radically different because inspiration, I think, stems from a place of pity where it's like you didn't expect the person to be able to accomplish it. So now that they have, you're like, I don't even know what to do with myself. And it's like, you should never have that seed of doubt in the first place. Just because I'm disabled, just because we are disabled, does not mean that we cannot accomplish our goals. Does it mean that in 10 years I cannot, I can become the president of the United States? Like I can do whatever I wanna do. Um, and I think it's just, it's those gradual steps that fight the archaic notion that like disability is a death sentence. And especially in communities of color, this is so important because in communities of color, the amount of ableism you see is tenfold because it's the fact that like, we cannot even come to fathom that something is wrong and that you aren't like, especially as 
you know, a second generation American, you know, granddaughter of immigrants, you come to this country, you want your family to be better. And then your grandkid comes out with a disability. And it's like, I failed, like, that's it. Like the whole, the whole dream is over. And like, there's nothing left for me. And I mean, I was diagnosed with cerebral palsy when I was three years old. It's been 20 years since I was diagnosed with disability. And my grandma still cannot fathom me walking the streets of New York City by myself. And it's the, it's the notion that it's like, we have to dismantle those systems that being disabled means that you cannot be accomplished, that you cannot reach for your goals. Um, and I think the more that we begin to unlearn those, those practices and those habits, the better we will be. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen videos go viral of like young kids walking for the first time with prosthesis or braces. And it's like, okay, like why are we all having a moment over this person's achievement? Like, I believe they could do it. Why doesn't everyone else believe that as well? Um, so I think, and I understand that there's been so much societal, like society has trained us to think this way. So to begin to unlearn that is hard, but I think just being conscious of that little those little shifts, those like you, were, like we were saying, communication, tone, and verbiage is very, very subtle, but extremely important because it the connotation makes all the difference in the way that we see the community as a whole. Uh, yes, <laughs> and all of that. Oh my goodness! And and thank you for starting us off that way because ableism is such a huge huge conversation in the same way that sexism or racism is an entire semester of classes and information like we we're we're running low on time to like even really get a whole grasp of it um there is the inspiration and pity ableism that people experience which you were talking about um then there's like a more overt like disgust and uh, undesired nature of it as well. I, I think inspiration and pity is an important one to talk about because a lot of people just don't perceive that as a bad thing to do as an ableist thing. They're like, oh, but I'm being kind, or I'm being charitable. And it's just like you viewing disability as some kind of charity or pity is, is like part of the problem. Like you, you need to be able to see that they're human beings, <laughs> that we're human beings and a part of your communities. Um, and speaking of part of your communities, you also touched on like ableism and communities of color, which is such a complex topic as well, because like communities of color are also often like communities of poverty as well. Um, so there's a lack of access to like healthcare and medicine and information, um, as well as that like um, in the United States, like an immigration issue where like there's a lot of pressure to like achieve a capitalist American dream. And the moment that like maybe your parents find out that you have a disability, they're like, oh, well, that's it. Now we can't, we're failed and, and there's, there's no opportunities for us. Uh, definitely I've experienced some of that in my Latino family, like where they're like, okay, <laughs> there was like huge meltdowns about like discovering that I had a disability, um, because, uh, I was undiagnosed the majority of my life and figured it out in my twenties. Um, I had to basically, again, because of, uh, medical, medical ableism and medical bias, I had to essentially self-diagnose before I finally like kind of ripped the hospital apart and was like, freaking test me for this. <laughs> and they did. And I was correct. Um, so there's so many different barriers. And then of course, there's that surprise at our capacity. Like I'm surprised to see you out at a bar. I'm surprised to see you in medical school. When it, if you just take a few moments to think about it, to consider it, um, it's not a matter of necessarily disability that would prevent someone from doing it. It's the accessibility of the institution of the space that would allow me to come inside. Um, and the, and, I'm, and I set a bar as an example because I have like personal experiences with like being at a bar and just because I'm using a wheelchair, oh, I've had drunk 
disabled people cry in my face <laughs> just just at the sight of me um because wow how overwhelming <laughs> to like see a wheelchair user at the bar uh that's sarcasm but they were uh overwhelmed <laughs> um but um and then uh, so we got inspiration and pity, you got disgust and lack of desire, uh, surprise at our capacity, but which is really like, it, it's ableist because you're not considering that the system is what's holding us down, not necessarily our bodies. Um, but I also want to kind of put like lack of consideration and neglect onto like the ableist umbrella, because <laughs> as much as I think that there's a debate, right, of like, um, if an act is benevolent, or if there's no intent, then it can't be that bad. However, I think that when you accidentally murder people, um, then yeah, you're still going to be in the certain level of hell. Sorry, too bad if you didn't intend to do it. I don't know. Okay, but that's a very nuanced conversation, of course. Um, but the topics that come to mind is definitely the straw conversation and COVID. Um, and how people uh, their behavior throughout the pandemic has very much neglected disabled lives. And basically, upon the knowledge of like, this disease will only impact elderly people and disabled people, so many people decided that those lives didn't matter and so that they can behave however they want because um, <laughs> they're going to die anyway. That was the that was the the big thing. So lack of consideration and neglect in, the, in that way for me is also under the definition of ableism. And I'm like, I'm, I'm heading there because I know we've been like teasing about a straw conversation for a while. And I don't think we're going to get to really have it. But I do want to um, say that if you have been listening to like comments about straws throughout this conversation tonight, um, there is a video that I created explaining the entire thing called um uh, let's shoot uh straw bands are dangerous for disabled people and it's on youtube and it goes from beginning to end about how like once upon a time there was a viral turtle that got a straw stuck in its nose and everyone got very upset <laughs> and decided that we should ban all plastic straws um to which at one point i did make a twitter comment that was like so if the turtle had a condom stuck in its nose, we would ban all condoms. Um, yeah, the whole thing was ridiculous. Uh, plastic straws are a medical necessity for so many people. And no, they cannot use whatever other thing you su you're suggesting. Hemp, their allergies exist. Metal, glass, uh, disabled people are often a, maybe a little clumsy. And uh, there's even a story out there of someone who was using a metal or glass straw. And it's Dab them through the eye. Sorry if that's graphic. <laughs> and they died because they were using, a, they were a disabled person using a metal or glass straw and they fell on it. So all these like reusable things are big risks for disabled people um, and often not considered in these conversations. Um, and I'm sure Gabby has way more information about how like actually straws are not even. <laughs> A huge problem in the grand uh, scheme of things, um, but yeah. So that just to like round off my point that I think that the the lack of integration between communities between abled and disabled communities creates that lack of consideration, creates that neglect of our communities because people are very satisfied with that hierarchy. People are very satisfied to be segregated, abled and disabled happy to live in the obliviousness of like, I'm an able-bodied person. I think my immune system is great and I'm going to go out and do whatever I want and not care if I infect other people because they don't, they're not close enough to the community to, to have any kind of empathy. Um, so that's why I consider that as a form of ableism as well. I, I can't add to that. So for the sake of time, I'll just, I'm not even going to try to add to that. Those are excellent explanations. Those were very excellent. Thank you. We do only have three minutes left, um, but I guess it is, we're on the final question, which is great, which is just, 
I would love to hear from the three of you. We've talked about what the main issues are that we're facing when it comes to disability justice, um, when it comes to ableism, when it comes to how disabled individuals are cast aside in the climate conversations. What would you like to see for the future of disability justice? And even for people who may be tuning in, um, who want to, I guess, get involved in disability justice, figure out ways to educate themselves, become more conscious, um, places to donate to, volunteer to, when it comes to the future of disability justice, what would you like to see um, be done? Mm -hmm. Can we go? Okay. I have, a, I have a short one for this, which is that I would like to see people not considering ADA compliance as like the goal. I would like to see that compliance with laws that say that we should have access is like the very base level and that we should instead strive for inclusion. And I think that that's something for everyone to think about, climate scientists included, um, because it is, it's like in institutions, it's so ingrained that like, if you meet the ADA requirements, you have like checked that box and then you can move on. And so I think just moving forward, anyone can think like, it's not good enough to just be compliant and like we should be truly accessible. Go ahead, Daphne. Uh, that actually, I'm gonna share a tiny little story that correlates with what you just said, Gabby. So I ended up going to a state school um, for undergrad. Um, when I was applying to college, I was accepted to Harvard University. When I got accepted, you know, it was being being a granddaughter of immigrants. It was like I I did it. I like reached the thing. I I, I'm great. Everyone immediately in Dominican Republic thought I was the president of the United States. It was the greatest time of my life. It was very short lived because about a week later, when I had accepted you know, my admission, I was speaking to the Accessibility Student Accessibility Services Center, and they told me, "Give us a year to make our you know, campus more accessible for you, and then you can attend." And I was like. So I'm supposed to like just sit here for a whole entire year and I don't know, learn how to paint or something and, and wait for you, one of the most quote unquote prestigious institutions in our country to make it okay for me to attend your university. Mind you, when you read my, when you read my personal statement, I spoke about my disability and I'm a, I, live very openly with my disability. It was not a secret. Um, and that's to say that things like marking the 30th anniversary of the ADA, like, wow, that's amazing. Like, what does that even mean? Like, yes, we, we, reached, we reached those 30 years, but if we look at the community and the needs that we still have, how much better are they actually in the span of those 30 years than, than we were before that. Um, and I think that law, while it's important, it creates a level of complacency amongst able-bodied individuals where it's like, I did it, you know, I'm not gonna get the lawsuit. I'm not gonna get fined, you know, especially for like establishments and businesses. Once they meet those requirements and they get that check from, you know, the service industry people they're like we're good to go and it's like but does your restaurant have a bathroom that I can use inside or like do you have tables that are not like bar height tables like stuff like that where it's like the bare minimum isn't enough I also think for for folks tuning in who are like how do we center or how do we center disabled voices and activism invite them to the conversations, ask them to be part of the conversations and learn when it's time for you to step back and just listen and let them speak. Because I promise you, we have a lot of stuff to say and it's probably things you haven't heard before. Um, and I think when we're offering advice, sometimes it can come off a little bit hostile. And that's because we've dealt with a lot of a lot of crap and a lot of just running around and just overall oppression that when we finally have someone willing to listen, it's like, we're just gonna let it all out. 
and I, I advise people to like don't take that personally I'm not like angry at you I'm just angry at the whole system and the whole thing um so take the take the passion with the grain of salt but really listen to what we have to say um and continue inviting us to conversations and continue asking questions um but also like do your research there's so much out there about our communities we are writers we are actors we are doctors we are scientists we're doing everything imaginable and we are changing the game as you know, as it happens. Um, but oftentimes we're not put at the forefront of even our own projects, because again, disability is not palatable. So do your research, find, find, you know, people with disabilities who inspire you, who motivate you, because we're out there and we're doing awesome work. Oh, um, all of that. I, I, uh, I absolutely agree. I think that visibility is incredibly important to the disability justice movement. I, I, I think a lot of the work is being done within the disability community. However, I would really like to see an immense change in like the poor allyship that I, that I am constantly critiquing. Um, there it's growing slowly but it's so important that if you do not see disabled people in your life, and if you do not see disabled activists in your life, then you seek them out and you follow them on whatever social media that you're, that you're on, you, you, you seek out their work, you seek out their essays, you seek out their videos, and you become more informed on what is going on. So that way you don't accidentally step on or accidentally literally kill anybody with <laughs> the actions that you that you do in your daily life or that you participate in um uh, just just to circle back to like what i was saying before about like neglect and and like lack of consideration and the lack of knowledge like that that is on us as individuals to continue to seek out information continue to 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 try to be more informed as opposed to just laying in complacency and being all right with obliviousness just because we feel more at peace that way it's actually actively harmful to communities when you when you do that thank you to the three of you i know we're five minutes over time so thank you also to everyone who stayed until the end but you guys have shared such amazing points just snaps spitting facts all around so i am very grateful to have been able to have this conversation with all of you thank you again for coming and for sharing your insight and for just all the knowledge and that you've dropped in all the educational content so thank you so so much um for everyone tuning in please please check them out um on i will link their their instagrams and youtube channels um social handles down below so you guys can check them out but Yes, thank you everyone for tuning in. That's all that we have for you. Um, yes, thank you again to the three of you. I'm still fangirling still, as you can tell, but thank you so, so much for this conversation. It's brightened up to my Thursday evening. So thank you so much. <laughs>